before I do give a talk, I'm going to present a lot of ideas that have come together um, uh, over the past many years. There's a host of different uh, senior collaborators here, including uh, the birthday boy. Um, I want to give a, a particular um, shout out to Lou Wei. I'll talk a little bit about data that we've been collecting with her over the past few months. She just started at the same time I left Caltech, and um, it's been a, a so to be building and uh, two labs at the same time and actually get cool data is 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 a lot of fun. And then of course my own my own research group. Okay, so this is what Nathan Price talked about this stuff, and. Um, so whenever I see data like this, I think um, I think this because I can't say it. F Felix, I'm not even going to try to say it. Um, this is from you know Virgil, which I'm sure we all remember by heart. Um, but what it uh, translates into is "Lucky be he who has been able to understand the causes of things." And the point being that this is a a large correlation network. There's no causation here. And I think if we look into the future of health, I think the idea that what um, you know, Lee and Nathan have been pushing forward and that this idea of monitoring patients, kinetics, etc., very, very powerful. But correlations are not particularly predictive. And, um, and I'll give you one example where here's a you know, you can do deep learning, you can do lots and lots of cars on, and bicycles and pedestrians and hours of the day and put together statistics like this that shows, basically this is in Seattle, uh, bicycle traffic, these are the rental bikes and this is basically commuters, and car traffic, and these look um, extremely well correlated. And yet if you hypothesize an experiment that you outlawed automobile traffic, suddenly they would be wildly anti-correlated. And that's kind of what we do in drugging and hypothesizing for, you know, you actually say we have these, all these things are correlated, let's knock this out and it's going to work for sure. And it doesn't work for sure because the body finds ways to traffic out that, around that knockout. And so <clears throat> when one thinks about going beyond correlations, and I think this is also in the vein of what Nathan talked about. I'm an experimentalist, so I'll talk about more experimental ways to think about this. But you have correlations, and so here's one. Lee will likely dream of some new huge problem to solve. Why? You know, you don't really have a good reason other than that's kind of his past behavior. Bayesian law relations are actually a, a uh, not nearly as intuitive, and, uh, and this is an example of one. Um, if I have a breast, if I have breast cancer, what's the odds that my mammogram will reveal that cancer? And it's about 80%. But if you say I have a mammogram and I see a lesion, what's the odds that I actually have breast cancer? It's actually less than 1%. No one in their right mind would take a diagnostic test that gives you 1% fidelity. And yet because it's so easy to think in this direction, hard to think in this direction, it's kind of what happens. And then reasoning relationships would be, you know, in the example I just gave, if automobile traffic is blocked, what happens? Well, you reason through it and you say, well, people actually need to get to work and that really was what strongly motivates traffic at, at eight and five. And so bus commuters are gonna go up by a lot. And so you would, could reason through a, an issue like this. And so, so how to go beyond correlations is really what I wanna talk about here. And I'll present a few examples of that, and then I'll present uh, a lot of areas where I think there is a vast amount of unexplored space. And the boundary condition on everything I'll talk about is that you've got to get it out of the blood. And I believe that that is a boundary. If you ever want to translate, I am, like Lee, I'm a firm believer that measurements are going to become cheap. Information is already practically free. And, um, and, but, but, but if you want to um, get information out of, a, out of a patient and you want to get it cheaply and rapidly, you've got to do the blood. Um, and so a, 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 a sort of a causal loop relationship might look something like this. So let's say you have a couple questions you want to answer. Uh, cancer, 
uh, what stage is the cancer. Obviously, you don't answer these in reverse. If you know the stage of the cancer, you already know the cancer. This is a single arrow. And then you'll have some protein markers that somehow will relate to whether you have cancer or not. But if you have cancer, what's the odds of having these protein markers elevated in the blood? That's a separate question. Um, and then you've got same things with um, metabolites and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, so let's talk about um, the measurement science behind this. So if you just take one set of analytes, and in fact you take a set of analytes that's pretty well studied, it's actually not that complicated. And the reason why is because you have large databases you can look up. And so this is one of these patients for which the um, uh, ISB and Arabelle have these data clouds. And this is a patient who was monitored for about the course of a year. And then at some point out here was diagnosed with stage four uh, disease. And you can see that there's, uh, at this point here at day 300, there's a host of different cancer mar uh, markers that are elevated. And with a little bit of database search, it's not really hard to figure out what's going on. Um, all of these are either cancer or disease-related uh, genes. The red ones are actually known drug targets. And there's even three of these that indicate elevated RAS pathway signaling. So that's, I think, a pretty straightforward way when you have that kind of information to look into the blood. No stage in information, but you can at least answer that first question about whether you have cancer or not. If you look at... Um, a measurement like this, where now we've got basically um, energy sources, nitrogen and carbon sources, as well as just uh, sources of energy being taken up and metabolites, and you've got these various proteins. Um, now, this is a more complicated set of relationships, and from an experimental point of view, you know, we've grown up in science by developing sequencing methods and protein methods and metabolite methods, and none of them are the same. And so, that's actually had an interesting cultural phenomena in that people who know a lot about metabolites oftentimes don't know a lot about genetics, okay? But it's also had a phenomena that you actually don't measure the same things from the same sample, um, and just because the chemistries are different. So this, is a, so this is an area that we've been trying to develop for the past few years, and I'm just gonna give a, one simple example, but give you a picture of how you can develop a sort of a causal a Bayesian type of relationship out of it. So if you do single cell analysis and you're actually able to measure this panel from single cells and there's a lot of, uh, uh, that's, this, is, this is the trick that we developed in my lab, I'm not gonna talk about it, but right now we can measure on the order of a dozen metabolites and about 20, 30 proteins. Here's two, glucose and then a, a, a product of glycolysis, lactate. And then there's a host of cancer markers here. And if you laser lots of single cells, every dot on here represents a single cell, and clearly this is correlated. And so there's no arrow between these two, but you can draw this correlation. So this is just a piece of that big correlation network that you saw before. But if you do perturbations, and here we actually knock out um, EGFR signaling with an EGFR inhibitor, a known drug, then you actually completely lose glucose. But on the other hand, if you try to do a perturbation on the glucose side, which is with this uh, drug that um, uh, was tested for, I think, diabetes type things, it's, not, it's like metformin or something like that, you have no effect at all on the EGFR, but you certainly change how the glucose is used inside these cells, and you can measure that and quantitate it through what happens to the lactate. And so that tells you that you actually have an arrow here. And if there's a reverse arrow, it's a really weak arrow, okay? So this seems like a hard experiment. And in fact, you know, to do this initially is pretty hard, but um, I'm, try I'm gonna try to talk about experiments that have scale, where you could actually begin going through and really mapping these things out in a big way. And, and this particular technology now is commercialized. There are, um, and, 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 it's, and it's being used in almost every single CAR T cell based um, uh, uh, immunotherapy out there right now. And, and now it's being applied to other disease conditions like uh, diabetes and sepsis. So it scales well. So one can actually imagine doing experiments like this and really building up the types of database to, to begin establishing causative relationships between at least simple metabolites. <clears throat> 
than proteins. Um, but I think where the world gets um, uh, much more complicated experimentally is one one thinks about you know lipids, proteins, ma small metabolites, and, and transcripts. So we kind of think we know these relationships okay, although you can still be surprised. Um, but these relationships we don't understand. And, and so let me walk through a set of experiments that we've been doing recently to try to establish these relationships. So this is a series of patient melanoma cell lines, untreated, just taken from the patient and, 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 and cultured. And they represent the different stages of carcinogenesis. They start off with a, actually a, a very aggressively growing cell, but one that is not invasive, to cells that almost go through a sort of a quiescent stage and then uh, an invasive but not quite as aggressively growing cell here. Okay, so this would be similar to an epithelial to mesenchymal type transition, although there are melanoma cells, but it's the same biology. And so if you look at the transcriptome associated with this transition here, and you mind you say specifically what's happening on the metabolic front, you actually begin to see that a lot of things are happening on the metabolic front. So here's one, APOE, this is the same one that, that um, is associated with Alzheimer's, but in this case it's actually functioned normally. And this is the lipid transporter. And, and one thinks about the fact that you eat fat and it's good for your brain, there you go. Okay, but these lipids are not particularly useful, but they're becoming available for this lipid transporter. This guy here actually catalyzes the hydrolysis of these things to make them into basically free fatty acids. This guy here, HPGD, which is actually expressed in the placenta, and so that tells you almost immediately this is a cancer-related thing, because it's, it's coming from dedifferentiated cells, um, actually will turn these guys into very, very potent molecules called prostaglandins, which actually have a steroidal-like behavior. And then there's some over here that are being turned on to supply um, additional carbon sources through glucose. And, uh, and let me talk about this just a little bit more, because you know, I started, when I started looking into this, I looked at these big data clouds that we have, and the proteins, we pretty much know what to do with the proteins. The genome, you can look at genetic risk factors. The metabolites, Nathan's telling me it's changing a little bit now, but the metabolites are a big whatever. There's a lot of, there's a lot of metabolites measured, but it's like whatever, okay? So here's two, of these, of these long chain um, omega-3 fatty acids, okay? And what is absolutely fascinating about these is that under the right enzymatic stimuli, they can become as potent of immune stimulators, immune repressors, wound resolvers, as one can imagine. And so here's these prostaglandins that have these sort of steroidal-like properties. Here's one that actually is, is, is inflammatory, and it's just have this guy here just appended this, th this guy. This is, um, these two guys are called a maricin and resolvin, and these guys are very active in the sort of making the wounds go away, the last stages of, 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 of wound resolution, which is why this guy's called resolvin. Um, here's one. Um, uh, this is like that Virgil word, the, the whole, I don't, I'm not going to say it, even though I'm a chemist and I should be able to say it. But, but this is just that molecule right there, but it's had appended to it, this guy, and that makes it a readily available carbon source. And anybody who knows about what's going on as these cancer cells progress, they need carbon to grow, but they also need methylation sources for altering the DNA as they go through state changes, etc. And if you look in these data clouds, this is... Um, one of these patients, look, this is metabolites. And of all the metabolites that were um, elevated in this patient by, um, by two standard deviations, so quite a bit, all of these cholines, these are all examples of these, this was a choline, I can say that. Choline is just that methyl source. And so that's, to me, a pretty clear indicator that this, something in this body is needing choline in a big way, and if you look and you say, well, where does this get used a lot? It gets used in fetal tissue expansion in both the mother and the placenta. This is baby, basically a smoking gun of cancer in this person's blood. Okay, so how do you tie these together? So here is um, 
a, a Raman spectra of, of those three, uh, those four or five cell lines that represent this, this, this transition from sort of epithelial to mesenchymal, but in melanoma. And, if you, and they basically look exactly the same. This is pretty boring. So everybody knows Raman is just infrared. You're looking at, uh, but the selection rules are different than infrared absorption. But it turns out you can take this data, and this is something I've been working for a long time with Ravi Levine, and you can use information theory to pull out what are called steady state components of these Raman spectrum, and then those that show the most variance as you evolve from this epithelial to mesenchymal. And this is the, the most dominant one that varies, and, um, and we just call it G1. There's G2, G3, G4, and G5 that we resolve. Um, but here you see that lipids in this in, in, are, are cranked up in this particular unbalanced process, and um, proteins are down. You can point out a aromatic amino acid. You can make assignments to most of these peaks. But now if we look at this behavior over time in this, in this uh, melanocytic to mesenchymal transition, what you find is that it goes from high down to low, which implies that when this is low, there's lots more protein, and when it's high, there's lots less protein, and vice versa for lipid. So knowing that, you can go and image these cells, and you actually see this lipid-protein ratio change. You can do a lot more than that, and I'll walk through a little bit, but, but this just gives you an example. So these are these melanocytic cells, and as you go around to these mesenchymal cells, um, the red color, the blue is just a nuclear stain, but the red color is this ratio of lipids to proteins. So what's happening here? You can, you can, you can identify where this, the carbon source of these is coming from by basically giving deuterium labeled glucose, which actually, exactly, it's not a glucose surrogate, it's actually glucose, and then do Raman on the deuterium glucose um, products. And so you give the cells deuterium glucose and you wait for three days, and here, look, these fastest growing cells are the only ones that are holding these, these uh, that, that, and they're turning these, 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 this, this glucose into, the, into a, a carbon source, into, into proteins. And when you image for the proteins, just looking at this uh, CH3 bond, if you think about proteins have branches, they don't have a lot of CH2 groups, lipids have a lot of CH2 groups, um, then it's really, really clear. And so you can see pretty cool structures like this nucleolus here, but you can also see that, that these, uh, where these deuterium is, hap is going into these proteins. And so the point of this story is that you have this network, which I've given you pieces of it, this network, this causal loop network, it actually evolves. That's the beauty of this thing. It actually evolves as the cancer progresses. And because it evolves, it actually contains information about the stage of the disease. Now, you're looking in the blood, the blood's a noisy environment, but it tells you that in principle, if you become clever enough about what you're measuring, you maybe have the patient drink deuterated water, I don't know what. Um, that's a joke, don't do that, don't do it at home, it'll kill you, okay? Um, that, you can, that, that you probably, out of the blood, can begin using these types of, of relationships to look at, at information related, not just the, 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 the disease, but the stage of the disease as well. So, so what happens if you do that? So if you, if you do early detection of cancer, which, and, and you're actually able to, 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 to stage it to some extent, prior to when able, being able to see the disease, your options right now are actually really limited. You can do um, watchful waiting, which I would say is not really an intervention, it's just basically sitting around. You can do, if you have a chance of breast cancer, you can do tamoxifen or a similar for life. And people actually do that. No one really knows if it works because no one stays in that regimen for life. And so the statistics are not, are not good on that. Or you can actually have your organs removed, um, which is a, a pretty, uh, it's like what Angela Jolie did, but it's, it's, it, that's a pretty, so there got to be other options. And so... Another question you might put inside that little circle is what interventions are appropriate and how can we determine those interventions? And you know, with, I think with immunotherapy, especially at very, very early stage disease, 
um, uh, effective vaccines or things like that might actually be might, might actually work. And so, so I'm gonna um, stop by or, or, or put two more pieces of data up um, that ask, you know, what more do we need to add to these clouds to try to pull up interventions? And one of them, and I think. Um, and this is actually, if I was going to give a talk about the current, I would have focused completely on this, because this is basically our, our, our life right now almost, is, um, is understanding the B and T cell repertoire completely and their antigens. Just knowing this, the genes is not important. You've got to know the antigens. And, 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 and for these, CD8 C cells are kind of easy. CD4 T cells are really hard. B cells are flat out impossible. So if you want to set up a research program for your lab, that's a, that's a way to go. Um, and so this is an example of a CD8 T cell. That's the uh, antigen that sits there in the, this is the class one MHC, the antigen presenting cell. That's the, for, for a uh, CD8 T cell, that's the, that's the antigen, purple, right, like a hot dog in a groove there. And those are the alpha beta genes. And it turns out that if you actually do a measurement these days and look into databases, and these are hard measurements to do, but you can even go to some, this is an example, it's kind of a rigged problem, but you can go to some of the very rare T cells that one finds in a patient and put them through a computational network and identify what the, what the specificity of those T cells is. That's relevant because your disease history means you can read it out and that's gonna tell you a lot and your T cell will tell you a lot about how you're gonna to respond to something coming up. It's also going to let you, if you really could do this, in a simple way, it's going to define uh, vaccine interventions that I think could be, could be pretty effective. The second piece of information that's missing is organ specificity. And I think one can get a little bit of that, but when you have cancer cells de-differentiating, it's, it's a little more complicated because they can sort of lose a lot of their organ identity. And so I show this picture here. Um, this is a, 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 a microscopy that... Uh, uh, um, um, Yue Lu and Alphonsus and my group did. So we've taken, this is just uh, cancer cells, we've blown them up. So this is, you know, the size of, generally would be the size of many cancer cells, but it's, it's smaller than even one here because we use this gel approach to expand them. But what it allows us to do is to see all these little green dots here. And these green dots are the extracellular vesicles that are actually given, being shed by, these, by this tissue and actually contain the proteins and the mRNAs and the, and the, and the, and the uh, 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 lipids that are coming out of these tissues. And so I think it's probably possible to now begin to resolve, you know, you can see them, and that means you can measure them. And, and, and there's work going around around the world here. But to be able to, these are definitely in the blood, resolve a lot of tissue specificity by looking at these sort of shed, shed signals. And so, um, I think, you know, in the future, all the experiments I mentioned, and there's no intrinsic reason why that can't be true, can be done in high throughput. I didn't talk about any, I talked about stuff that might require like Caltech postdoc skill, but not stuff that can't be engineered and made simple. Um, and I think the, and, and, and done on, you know, many patients, but I think most importantly on blood. Um, but, but maybe you'd look at tumors and cell lines, what have you, to establish these causal relationships. Um, I think you can establish rigorous and formal algorithms that can ask these critical questions. And, you know, there's a lot of things that one worries about when you look at, like, Bayesian relationships, you worry about confounders and things like that. But if you actually have this type of, a, of an algorithm, you don't have to worry about confounders. They account for that for you. You don't need it. And, and I think what this is, so I'm pointing to probably the same thing that, 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 um, that Nathan did, is that when you look at these clouds, especially if you have an algorithm like this, you know, no, there's no biomarker that tells you you have cancer. There's a disease trajectory that's mined through these clouds that tells you, and everybody is different. So I didn't cherry pick the patients here. I showed you some patients with, with data. But every patient that was on, these, uh, on this cloud that we looked at that, had, that developed stage something disease while on, 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 on air, air valve monitoring, you can absolutely see it uh, quite a bit before the, the clinical diagnosis. But no one looks the same. And the fact that we're thinking about now uh, medicines that are all personalized, we're thinking about regimens that are personalized, you, know, you would never do, pers you'd never do diagnostics that are for 
the average person. It just doesn't make any sense. And so I think that that's, that's where this heads. And with that, that's the whole ISB. That's where I work now. <laughs> and thank you.